Good afternoon and welcome to our press conference. I'm joined on stage by ECB President Lagarde and ECB Vice President De Guindos. My name is Wolfgang Preussel. I would kindly ask all journalists who participate to turn on their cameras when they ask questions and to unmute themselves so we can see them. I would like now to give the floor to President Lagarde. President Lagarde, please. Thank you very much. And good afternoon. The Vice President and I welcome you all to our press conference. The euro area continues to recover strongly, although momentum has moderated to some extent. Consumers continue to be confident and their spending remains strong. But shortages of materials, equipment and labour are holding back production in some sectors. Inflation is rising, primarily because of the surge in energy prices, but also as the recovery in demand is outpacing constrained supply. We foresee inflation rising further in the near term, but then declining in the course of next year. Market interest rates have increased since our last meeting in early September. However, overall financing conditions remain currently favourable for firms, households and the public sector. Favourable financing conditions are essential for the economy to continue its recovery and to counter the negative impact of the pandemic on the inflation path. We continue to judge that favourable financing conditions can be maintained with a moderately lower pace of net asset purchases under the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme than in the second and third quarters of this year. We also confirmed our other measures, namely the level of the key ECB interest rates, our forward guidance on their likely future evolution, our purchases under the Asset Purchase Programme, our reinvestment policies and our longer-term refinancing operations, as detailed in the press release that was published at 1.45 today. We stand ready to adjust all of our instruments, as appropriate, to ensure that inflation stabilise at our 2% target over the medium term. I will now outline in more detail how we see the economy and inflation developing and will then talk about our assessment of financial monetary conditions. Looking at the economic activity, the economy continued to grow strongly in the third quarter, even though momentum moderated to some extent. We still expect output to exceed its pre-pandemic level by the end of this year. The grip of the pandemic on the economy has visibly weakened, with restrictions being lifted as a result of successful health measures and large numbers of people now vaccinated. This is supporting consumer spending, especially on entertainment, dining, travel and transportation. But higher energy prices may reduce purchasing power in the months to come. The recovery in domestic and global demand is also supporting production and business investment. That said, shortages of materials, equipment and labour are holding back the manufacturing sector. Delivery times have lengthened considerably and transport costs and energy prices have surged. These constraints are clouding the outlook for the coming quarters. The labour market continues to improve. Unemployment has fallen and the number of people in job retention schemes is down significantly from the peak last year. 
This supports the prospect of higher incomes and increased spending. But both the number of people in the labor force and the hours worked in the economy remain below their pre-pandemic levels. To sustain the recovery, targeted and coordinated fiscal support should continue to complement monetary policy. This support will also help the economy adjust to the structural changes that are underway. An effective implementation of the next generation EU programme and the Fit for 55 package will contribute to a stronger, greener and more even recovery across Euro area countries. Let's look at inflation. Inflation increased to 3.4% in September. We expect it to rise further this year. But while the current phase of higher inflation will last longer than originally expected, we expect inflation to decline in the course of next year. The upswing in inflation largely reflects a combination of three factors. First, energy prices, especially for oil, gas and electricity, have risen sharply. In September, energy inflation accounted for about half of overall inflation. Second, prices are also going up because recovering demand related to the reopening of the economy is outpacing supply. These dynamics are especially visible in the prices of consumer services, as well as the prices of goods affected most strongly by supply shortages. And third and finally, base effects related to the end of the VAT cut in Germany are still contributing to higher inflation. We expect the influence of all three factors to ease in the course of 2022 or to fall out of the year-on-year -year inflation calculation. As the recovery continues, the gradual return of the economy to full capacity will underpin a rise in wages over time. Market and survey-based measures of longer-term inflation expectations have moved closer to 2%. These factors will support underlying inflation and the return of inflation to our target over the medium term. The recovery continues to depend on the course of the pandemic and further progress with vaccination. We see the risks to the economic outlook as broadly balanced. In the near term, supply bottlenecks and rising energy prices are the main risks to the pace of recovery and the outlook for inflation. If supply shortages and higher energy prices last longer, this could slow down the recovery. At the same time, if persistent bottlenecks feed through into higher than anticipated wage rises or the economy returns more quickly to full capacity, price pressures could become stronger. However, economic activity could outperform our expectations if consumers become more confident and save less than currently expected. Let's look at the financial and monetary conditions. Growth and medium-term inflation dynamics still depend on favorable financing conditions for all sectors of the economy. Market interest rates have increased. Nevertheless, financing conditions for the economy remain favorable, not least because bank lending rates for firms and households remain at historically low levels. While there was a, a pickup in September, lending to firms remains moderate. This continues to reflect the fact that firms generally need less external funding since these have high cash holdings and are increasingly retaining their earnings. Lending to households remains strong, driven by demand for mortgages. 
Our most recent bank lending survey shows that credit conditions for firms stabilized and were supported for the first time since 2018 by a reduction in banks' risk perceptions. By contrast, banks are taking a slightly more cautious approach to housing loans and have tightened their lending standards for these loans accordingly. Bank balance sheets continue to be supported by favorable funding conditions and remain solid. Let me conclude. The euro area economy continues to recover strongly, although at a more moderate pace. Rising energy prices, the recovery in demand and supply bottlenecks are currently pushing up inflation. Now, while inflation will take longer to decline than previously expected, we expect these factors to ease in the course of next year. We continue to foresee inflation in the medium term remaining below our 2% targets. Our policy measures, including our revised forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates, are crucial to helping the economy shift to a sustained recovery and ultimately to bringing inflation over the medium term to our target. We are now ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question today goes to Annette Weisbach of CNBC. Annette, the floor is yours, please. President Lagarde, thank you very much for taking my questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfectly. Um, I was wondering, because the market, was, or, well, everybody was anticipating that this meeting was all about inflation. So what have you been discussing and what, what was on, on top of your agenda? And was there at least a slight different assessment to the nature of inflation, given that inflation is at a 13-year high now for the Eurozone? My second question would be on the market's expectation about the rate hike. Your chief economist was saying that um, the market has not fully absorbed your new forward guidance. Perhaps you can tell us more about it and why the market is wrong to expect a rate hike uh, already by next year. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, actually, we talked about inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, that has been a, a, a topic that has uh, occupied a lot of our time, a lot of our debates, and we went, I think, in-depth into analyzing uh, the, um, the factors that are driving inflation. And we looked at, obviously, what is happening now, which is clearly of concern, particularly to citizens of Europe. But we also looked at the medium-term uh, outlook that we have. And, uh, you know, I... I think I would summarize those factors uh, driving inflation, as we see it at the moment, in, in two key categories. Uh, one is related to pandemic and recovery, and the other one is related to energy. If you look at the one that is um, related to recovery and the post-pandemic period, we are seeing shortages. We're seeing shortages in equipment, we're seeing shortages in labor, and that has to do with the fact that uh, the rebound of demand, the decompressed demand, if you will, is not exactly connected with the supply. And we have this supply-demand um, disconnection. The second, as I said, is energy. And on that front, we have uh, drivers of the energy prices that have to do with the recovery, that have to do with uh, the demand, but also other factors having to do with inventory, with uh, the wind, with maintenance in Norway, with demand in China, with the supply by Russia, all elements that actually are contributing to the high energy prices that we are facing at the moment. Those are the three uh, key buckets uh, that are causing inflation, as we discussed it um, today and, and yesterday afternoon. Now, there is a third category, uh, which uh, is very much related to the base effects. And I would 
put first and foremost, obviously, the German VAT, which is going to continue to impact our inflation numbers until the end of this year, but which will disappear as of January the 1st. So that's one category base effects that, that will fade as of the beginning of the year. We also believe that the other two uh, buckets that I have just discussed uh, with you, that is recovery related and pandemic consequences on the one hand, energy prices on the other hand, we have every reason to believe that they are going to gradually fade over the course of 2022. And I'm happy to discuss further, but there might be other questions on this, this particular matters. We, we did talk a lot about those, and we did um, a lot of soul searching um, to actually test our analysis. And we are confident that this analysis of the temporality of those two categories uh, is actually correct and will lead to a decline over the course of 22. Now, granted, it will take a little longer than what we had expected, and the bottlenecks will, will gradually um, be sorted out, but it will take a bit longer. And on the energy front, we also believe that it's in the course of 22 that we will see uh, a, a decline in, uh, in an, at least a stabilization, if not a decline of energy prices. So that was you know, predominantly uh, what, we, what we discussed uh, with members of the Governing Council uh, this morning and, uh, and, and yesterday. We also obviously looked at the uh, financial conditions that prevail at the moment in order to arrive at our monetary policy decisions. But inflation took a lot of our, of our time and it takes quite a bit of the space of the uh, monetary policy statement that you have in, in front of you. I would, by the way, add that um, you know, our... Um, analysis certainly uh, does not support uh, that the conditions of our forward guidance are satisfied uh, at the time of liftoff as expected by markets, nor, nor any time soon thereafter. So you asked me about this um, market expectations regarding liftoffs, and you know, we, we look at, at all of that, but we really very deeply looked and tested uh, our analysis of the uh, drivers of inflation, and we are confident that our um, anticipation and our analysis is actually correct. Thank you. And the next question goes to Carolyn Look of Bloomberg News. Carolyn, the floor is yours, please. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for uh, taking my questions. President Lagarde, um, you and many of your colleagues have pushed back against the idea that you need to tighten policy in response to the, the inflation spike that we're seeing, but many of your global counterparts have, in fact, uh, started doing so. So could you explain in what ways the Eurozone's underlying inflation dynamics are fundamentally different to those that we see in other advanced economies, or do you think that other central banks might be overreacting to the rise in prices? And uh, secondly, on the pet pace, um, you decided in September to slow your pet purchases um, to a moderately slower uh, pace in the fourth quarter, but we haven't actually seen that in any of the weekly data so far this month. So is, does this have to do with, um, you know, countering the effects of policy tightening expectations or, or how should we read this data? Thanks. Sure. Well, let, let me start with the, uh, the, the latter part of your question, which has to do with, the, uh, with um, our PEP um, purchases and, uh, and the decision that we made and that we reiterated uh, this morning at our monetary policy meeting to slow the pace of purchase as compared with the second and third quarter of um, uh, 2021. And this has, in fact, been the case. Uh, this is what happened in September, this is what was decided for October, and this is the view that we have taken uh, this morning as well. So, slow down in the pace of purchases, which is, as I said last time around, this is not tapering, this is calibrating appropriately on the basis of the commitment that we made back in December last year to look at a combination of the financing conditions to determine that they are favourable and a look at what the inflation outlook is. 
and we came to the conclusion yet again this morning that on the basis of both uh, financing conditions that are favorable, particularly at the level of corporates and households, where they are at uh, historically interest uh, rates are at historically low level and they seem to be plenty of supply of, of lending available. Uh, and that when we look at the inflation outlook, we concluded that the same, <clears throat> the same assessment was appropriate this time around. Now, you um, ask me to compare with other central banks. First of all, I think that comparisons, for good reasons, are odious, simply because we are not talking about the same economies. Uh, the outlook is different. Uh, the level of inflation that they have is different. Some of them are either at or above target already, including in the inflation outlook. And that fully justifies that they adopt different approaches. Some of those central banks uh, are in commodity producers and exporters uh, economies, and that also justifies uh, particular approaches. So clearly, the euro area is a very large uh, market economy. Um, it is not a small uh, open market economy. It uh, has to decide on the basis of data uh, what the monetary policy should be in order to uh, deliver on our mandate, which is price stability. And I can assure you that we are fully committed uh, to our 2% inflation in the medium term. That is our target. We have affirmed it in July. Uh, we are absolutely determined to deliver on that target. But we have to do that on the basis of data. We have to be patient. We have to be persistent uh, as, as to uh, our policy going forward. And that is particularly so at the uh, effective lower bound where we are, as we have indicated in our strategy review recently. Thank you. And now the next question goes to Klaus Reiner Jakisch of ARD Television. Klaus Reiner, over to you, please. Good afternoon, Mrs. President. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, the first one actually is not mine, but one we are receiving a lot by viewers, listeners, and readers at the moment. And if I may, I would like to summarize it like this. Um, um, they would like to know what are the preconditions to be necessary for the ECB to return to a kind of normality, and meaning by this uh, that interest uh, rates are going up again and that uh, the um, bond purchases uh, would be reduced or even stopped. And my second question relates to some research uh, the um, Center for Economic um, Research in Mannheim, Germany, has done recently, and they looked at a correlation by analyzing uh, statements and speeches of ECB um, um, uh, governing council members, and they found some correlation there on the one hand um, between fiscal interests by member states and monetary policy rather than um, price stability and monetary policy, which one perhaps might um, expect. Basically, they are uh, suggesting that there is a certain kind of focus on fiscal policy by some uh, governing council members, and that may, that is their suggestion, uh, influence the decision-making process. How do you feel about these findings? Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me clarify, first of all, that uh, the European Central Bank is independent. and is uh, bound by the Treaty uh, of Europe, to put it simply, which gives us one mission, and that is price stability. So as I said, we are committed to deliver the price stability that forms our mission under the European uh, treaties. This is our commitment, and we have defined it very specifically uh, by indicating that price stability for our purposes, will be defined as this 2% symmetric target in the medium term. So that is what will guide us in delivering uh, our monetary policy as uh, the quarters and the years go by. Second point, as you know, we are still operating on the basis of the pandemic emergency purchase program. And that was fully justified given the totally exceptional circumstances and very severe circumstances that affected the whole world, but particularly the euro area which we are concerned about. This pandemic emergency purchase program, PEP, uh, is at this point in time, in my view, going to end 
at the end of March 22. So you asked me about the return to uh, what you would regard as normal policies. I, I'm, I'm not sure what is normal policies. Uh, there is the traditional uh, tools that were used in the past and that have been used to good effect. And over the course of uh, the development of the financial crisis in particular, of the um, European sovereign debt crisis, uh, new territories had to be explored in order to deliver on the price stability mandate that was assigned to the ECB. And as a result of that, uh, the ECB had to go into negative rate territory and also had to develop uh, asset purchase programs over the course of time. So as I mentioned, one of these programs, PEP, at this point in time when we speak and when we look at the situation, I have every reason to believe that it will come to its end uh, in, in March 22, which was the term that was envisaged in the first place. And as far as the rest is concerned, we are going to be bound by our forward guidance, which we have spelt out in, in, in three dimensions, if you will, in order to give some guidance as to when we will lift interest rates. And those three elements, I would like to just mention them yet again, uh, have to do with inflation, as you could imagine. And the first one is that inflation uh, reaches 2%, our target, well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. We have more certainty about our forecast. We have more elements to assess that. Second condition, that this inflation remains at those levels, 2%, durably for the rest of the projection horizon, which is roughly three years. And third, that there is sufficiently advanced realized progress in underlying inflation for headline inflation to stabilize at 2% over the medium term. So I think the conditions uh, for this um, interest lift off, which uh, is of interest to your audience, are pretty well spelt out in this forward guidance, which clearly under the current analysis uh, are not satisfied and, uh, and uh, certainly uh, not, in the, uh, not in the near future. Thank you. And the next question goes to Tonia Mastrobuoni of La Repubblica. Tonia, over to you, please. Yes, hello. Madame Lagarde, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much. So you mentioned before the shortages in materials and the supply chains bottlenecks uh, that are clouding the outlook in the next months um, uh, on inflation and on, 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 the, on, the, on the economy. Um, how long do you think they will last? Because uh, also Germany has yesterday had to correct uh, very heavily the outlook for uh, the economy and the inflation in the next months. But uh, there are many question marks still uh, remaining uh, uh, about how long could it last. So uh, I wanted to know how long would you think in your outlooks that uh, they could last. And uh, second question, in the worst case scenario, so if inflation wouldn't be temporarily uh, because these effects could last, um, do you see any risk of uh, stagflation? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. On, uh, on your first question, the supply bottlenecks. Um, first of all, it will fade. I mean, the economic actors are such that they are going to reconnect supply and demand. Uh, for those microchips that we don't have at the moment, factories are being built. Uh, for those vessels that are not available, there are some producing countries that are working on new vessels. Uh, for this... Uh, shipping to be better organized and hauling to be better sorted out in ports. This is going to gradually be settled and sorted out. So it will fade away. Second, it will most likely take a little longer than what we had anticipated and what most forecasters had anticipated. We just recently conducted uh, a corporate uh, telephone survey. So we, we, we make phone calls to various large accounts, medium-sized accounts, to ask them, you know, what do you see? When will you get your supplies? How long do you have to wait until there is delivery? And, you know, this is telling us that it will be settled and it will be sorted out in the course of 22, but not in the first quarter of 22. And some of them have been saying 
it will take the whole year uh, to, to properly settle. It will be gradual. Certain deliveries will come about earlier. But overall, it will take uh, a, a good chunk of 22 for it to be sorted out. And uh, the third point that I would like to make in relation to the, uh, the supply bottlenecks is, is a little bit of what you've seen, actually, with the readjustment of the growth projection for Germany. Reduced in the first place compared with projection, but in increased the following year. And you see very well that this is most likely going to happen in the supply bottlenecks business, where reduced supply is going to be channeled back to markets at some stage, and then there will be a reconnection between supply and demand. So we're really talking about the passing of time and how long that will be. Difficult to say, but certainly longer than what we had expected. And if we are to believe the corporate accounts and those that are in charge of logistics, of supply, of purchases, they're saying that in the course of 22, it will be resolved. So that's what I wanted to tell you about the, <clears throat> the supply shortages. I think you had another question, but I got... Stagflation. Oh, yeah, stagflation. Stagflation. We are not seeing stagnation to begin with, okay? So for there to be stagflation, you would have to have stagnation. We still have a strong recovery. The momentum is abating a little bit because of the shocks that we have just discussed, because of the supply... Um, bottlenecks because of the price of energies uh, going up. But we are not seeing any kind of stagnation uh, in the, uh, on, on our horizon. And as far as inflation is concerned, I think we, we have just discussed it. We see it rising, and it will continue to rise, by the way, until the end of this year, we believe. And it will begin declining uh, as of the beginning of uh, 22, simply because of the German VAT getting out of the, of the statistics, and then gradually over the course of 22, as the uh, bottlenecks are resolved and as energy prices will be reduced as well. If not reduced, at least stabilized, because that's what you have seen, we have seen, over the course of all the historical abrupt energy price rise, it doesn't rise forever, it stabilizes and eventually it, it settles a um, little lower. Thank you. And the next question goes to Francesco Canepa of Reuters. Francesco, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, hi guys. So the first question is about PEP. You told us that you expect uh, uh, to end it in March. Do you also see a chance that you may not use the envelope in full. I mean, how, how, how do you raise the probability of that? And the second question is about your ethics review. The Fed has tightened the rules governing how its policymakers invest their own money. I know you're doing your own review um, <clears throat> right now. So um, how do you plan to change those rules also in the Fed of the, in, in, the, in the light of the Fed's decision? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. As I said, at this point in time, I expect PEP to end at the end of March. Whether we will use the full envelope or not uh, is to be seen and will be a factor of the favorable financing conditions uh, as we will uh, determine over the course of the next few months until the end of March. So I cannot uh, tell you anything one way uh, or the other in that respect. And it will be a decision that will be made by the governing uh, council at large. We have not discussed that at all, uh, on either this morning nor yesterday. On the ethics uh, rules, as you know, we have a code of conduct, we have ethics uh, principles, we have an ethic officer, and uh, we publish uh, the um, holdings uh, that, uh, that board members have, that governing council members have, and so on and so forth. There have been quite a few pieces already committed as to who manages what, who owns what. And uh, our ethics uh, committee and the ethics officer are currently reviewing, revisiting those rules to make sure that, uh, that everything is, is plain, transparent, uh, without any conflict, and, uh, and uh, that uh, you know, those rules be adhered to and respected by all members concerned. Thank you. Next question is for Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, it's your turn. Thank you. Hello, Madame Lagarde. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello. Hello. Two very quick questions for you. 
Are markets getting ahead of themselves in expecting a rate rise as early as the end of next year? And how important is it for you to maintain some of the flexibility of PEP after PEP ends in March next year? Thank you. Are markets uh, ahead of themselves? Not, not for me to say. What, what I have to do and what I have to um, assess is the validity of our analysis. And then testing our analysis, once we've determined that it was correct, uh, against the conditions for our forward guidance. And what I can tell you, Martin, is that our analysis does not support that the conditions of our forward guidance are satisfied, neither at the time expected by markets of liftoff or any time thereafter soon. So I think that you know, I've, I'm very happy to go into further explanation as to why uh, we believe that inflation will continue to rise until the end of this year, will decline over the course of 2022, and at the end of our projection horizon, will be below our, our target. Um, that's the analysis uh, that we make. And I think that given the temporality uh, of the various uh, factors that I have um, opened the discussion with, whether it's bottlenecks, whether it's uh, energy, whether it is those base effects, I think that uh, uh, all, those, uh, all those elements uh, will actually fade out. They will fade out over a little longer but they will fade out. I think what I can also tell you is that we will be very attentive uh, to wages evolution. That will, of course, uh, be uh, critically important for the purpose of our underlying inflation analysis. But certainly on the basis of the data that we have today, uh, we have no reason to believe that uh, wages are going to sustainably increase and will produce the second round effect, which would lead us to probably reassess our, our analysis. On the issue of flexibility, I think we have demonstrated uh, when forming uh, PEP under the conditions that we know that we can actually uh, have the flexibility necessary in order to deliver on our mission of providing <coughs> the monetary policy stance and transmission uh, to deliver on our price stability mission. And we need to make sure that that remains the case. We've demonstrated it, and uh, I'm sure that we can, uh, we can do so in the future. Thank you. The next question is for Jean-Philippe Lacour of uh, Agence France Presse AFP. Jean-Philippe, over to you, please. Uh, Jean-Philippe, you seem to talk, but we cannot hear you. Now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So good afternoon, President Lagarde. Um, I have just only one question left. Um, so um, while uh, we will have uh, today, we have the ECB uh, adopting the statu quo, yes. And um, the tightening of monetary policy is expected in the United States and the UK in the next weeks or months. And that will weigh on the euro. So as then possible cheaper euro means imported inflation. What is that aspect highlighted during to today's discussion among members? And maybe let me, uh, uh, to finish, express a, a, a wish that the next and last press conference of the year could be held in presence as a sign that ECB has a growing belief that the pandemic is near to be over. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. What, what I hope is that um, maybe the first into uh, 2022 will be with physical presence because we are out of precaution. Uh, we have actually um, asked members of staff to um, respect the statu quo until the end of January, just to be on the safe side and to make sure that we don't expose staff uh, to, um, you, know, uh, san you know, pandemic issues, uh, risk of contagion, and we're taking every possible measures uh, to prevent a recurrence of what we saw in the past. But certainly, into, if we are successful with that, not just the ECB, but you know, many of us around here, then my hope is also that we can all see each other uh, 
real. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at empty chairs. I hope uh, to be looking at, uh, at uh, uh, bodies and faces and smiles and, and, uh, and, and your question in, in real life. On the issue of the spillover of any tightening measures that would be taken by either the Bank of England or the Fed, this is not a matter that we have discussed uh, today uh, at all. Thank you. And the next question goes to Francesco Ninfole of Milano Finanza. Francesco, please. Thank you and good afternoon. My first question is about asset purchases. Uh, in your opinion, is their duration or their volume more important in achieving the 2% target? Some governing council members seem to have expressed divergent views on this point. And secondly, on a different topic, uh, what do you think about the European Commission's proposal on Basel, Basel III requirements for banks, postponing the start to 2025? The ECB uh, had called for full and timely implementation of Basel III, but do you think it is useful to consider some European specificities, for example, on, on lending to uh, non-financial corporations? Thank you. Hmm. Turning to your first question of, the, um, of what matters most in respect of asset purchases, uh, we did not debate that at all uh, this morning or yesterday. Um, but we, we, this matter was raised in the past, and I think that uh, you rightly characterized um, the diversity of views. I think the dominant view is probably that volumes uh, matter more than duration, but I think the jury is out as to exactly what is the, what is the <clears throat> ultimate uh, right outcome to that question. Uh, on, on your other point concerning the European Commission communication about Basel III and, and other matters, uh, we, we just received it. Um, you're quite correct in that the timeline of implementation is not the one that was advocated uh, including by my colleague Andrea Enria of the SSM. And, um, you know, from my perspective, I would have liked uh, for having been an old, an old soldier of Basel III discussions for the last um, 10 years, actually, I would have liked uh, consistency and synchronicity uh, between all regions and, and all banks concerned by Basel III. But, you know, I, I don't want to pass judgment on that because I think it's a combination of an extension of the uh, implementation time, but also qualification of certain uh, matters uh, on the output floor, on, on various um, characteristics of the Basel III um, uh, principles. So let's, let's not rush to conclusion. Um, and let's make sure that the very specificity of European banking activity can be accommodated in as synchronized and consistent system uh, it can be. Thank you. And the next question goes to Michael Rasch of Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Uh, Michael, over to you, please. Good afternoon, Mrs. President. The first question to the resignation of Mr. Weidmann. Um, is it a healthy development when the representatives of the largest member state uh, regularly step down, frustrated by the governing council, probably, and the unconditionally expansionary monetary policy? And how can you solve the problem? And the second uh, very general question, is it really fair that countries like France or Germany have just as much only one vote in the Council as Malta or Luxembourg. There are probably other systems, such as linking the weight of the votes to the gross domestic product or, for example, for the size of the population. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And let me, uh, let me state very clearly that uh, we have had an excellent working relationship uh, with Governor Weidmann and that I uh, personally have had the pleasure of long years of uh, standing services in various capacity. When he was uh, advisor and Sherpa to Chancellor Merkel and when I was finance minister, subsequently when he became uh, 
president of the Bundesbank and, uh, and I was head of the IMF. So we go back a long time and we have a very good working relationship. As I have publicly said, uh, I regret uh, that he goes uh, and uh, I have enjoyed the relationship including in the governing council. And there is nothing um, in what he has told me and nothing in what he has told colleagues on the governing council that would hint in the direction of what you have alluded to as the cause for his stepping down. I think he has referred to 10 years is a long time and uh, there is a point in time when turning a page is not a bad idea. Uh, I think he has his own personal reasons as he has also indicated, but I certainly would not regard them as fatigue with the way in which the governing council has deliberated uh, under my leadership. Um, and as I said, you know, constant stepping down is a bit of an overstretch for somebody who has served for 10 years uh, in, in his position. Now, weighted voting, uh, interesting topic. It's just not in the cards and not in the, uh, the way in which Europe was, was constructed over the course of time. And it is certainly uh, not for the uh, European Central Bank to, to change that uh, and to, uh, to take a view on that particular matter. What I can assure you, though, of is that each country, member state of the euro area, has a voice, is listened to, is respected, and certainly some members, which are larger than others, play a more critical role and are more active, including in the implementation on monet of monetary policy, as well as its determination. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question is for Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, for you, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my question. President Lagarde, I have two questions. Uh, one, if I may go back to forward guidance, not on the three legs and the conditions, but on the fact that the governing council still expects the key interest rates to remain at present or even lower levels. And uh, can you explain why uh, on the forward guidance we'll still have a reference to lower levels? And can we expect that? to be uh, going by steps to be taken away. And my second question is on Teltros, because on December, the third series of the targeted longer term refinancing operations will end, I think, before the next governing council. So will there be a cliff edge or uh, will there be a transition towards a different Teltro? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your, your very pointed question uh, in relation to forward guidance. So, so I take it that I don't have to repeat my three criteria well ahead until uh, the end of our uh, projection uh, period, as well as uh, with real progress uh, on the underlying inflation. They are as they are, and you uh, understand them very well. Now, clearly, we have to continue being open to any eventuality. And I would say that, you know, it applies to uh, present, higher or lower, uh, depending on the circumstances. And this is a matter that is obviously for debate uh, by the Governing Council and that uh, will be certainly reviewed over the course uh, of time. Uh, on Teltro, you are right, and I think that we should do everything possible in order to avoid cliff edge effect. And this is a matter that we will be discussing at our next monetary policy uh, meeting, which, as you know, is planned for December, and at which we will have uh, new projections, uh, which will help us uh, reassess and test our analysis. Uh, we will also be looking at what happens in March, and uh, Teltro and the way in which Teltro phases out will be one of the topics that will be uh, discussed at that time. Thank you. And the next question goes to Luke Hayton of Market News International, MNI. Luke, uh, over to you, please. Good afternoon, President Lagarde. Good afternoon. Um, as a couple of people have, have previously alluded to, markets are pricing in 20 basis points of rate, rate hikes through the end of 2022. I wonder whether you're actually trying to signal the ECB's intentions to the wider economy uh, rather than the financial markets. I wonder if that's the case. And, and secondly, if that's not the case, 
Why does the ECB spend so much time trying to sell its message to financial institutions that appear not to be listening? Can you repeat the first part of your question? Because I don't think that I understood the, uh, the, the, the second branch of your reasoning. Do you mind? Oops, I can't hear you anymore. Sorry, I wonder yeah. whether, given that markets' uh, estimations of where um, uh, we are, we're going to be uh, in two years' time differ so much from the ECBs, are you actually trying to signal your intentions to the wider economy rather than the financial markets? That was the first question. And if that's not the case, my second question, why spend so much time trying to sell your message to institutions that aren't listening? I think the art of repetition and the determination of our conviction should eventually come through. Because you are quite right that there is a distinction between their expectations and our analysis in relation to our forward guidance, will deter which will determine uh, when we move on interest. And there is a disconnect between the two. So we have to ask ourselves where this disconnect lies in. And it's either a question of our forward guidance not being sufficiently clear so that it is understood, or it is a question of our inflation outlook not being uh, believed uh, by, uh, by, by markets, which is why, um, you will not be surprised, we spent a lot of time on dissecting our inflation analysis, uh, going under the skin of all the factors that are behind uh, inflation uh, outlook for this year, for next year, for 23, and trying to project ourselves into the medium term a bit further. And uh, we are uh, convinced that our assessment and our projections at this point in time are correct. As we are convinced and determined to actually deliver on our mission in accordance with our forward guidance. Nothing more, nothing less. And by the way, if I need to spend more time doing it, I will do so. But it's not going to change. Thank you. And the next question goes to Victor Mendes Barreira of uh, Central Banking. Victor, over to you, please. Uh, good afternoon, President Lagarde. Um, my first question is in relation to PEP purchases. You've stressed that these will expire in March 2022. Therefore, should markets expect a sharp reduction in ECB support and purchases? Or instead, uh, they should expect uh, a smooth transition with a higher up ADP purchases. And my second question is in relation to inflation. What makes the ECB so certain that inflation will fall over the course of 2022? Is it mainly, as you, as you explained before, related to the resolution of uh, bottlenecks in supply chains, or is um, in relation to the differences between the fiscal stimulus, for example, between the Eurozone and the US, for instance? Thank you. Well, thank, thank you so much. Um, as I said, at this point in time, uh, I expect PEP to conclude and uh, come to an end in March 22. What comes next is something that we will be debating at our next uh, Governing Council meeting in December. So more to come in that respect uh, at the end of our meetings in December. On the, uh, on the inflation, uh, what makes us uh, confident that inflation will decline in 22, is what I have tried to explain. So, what is behind inflation at the moment? We have those base effects, including in particular German VAT, which will go out as of the 1st of January. So that's of the chart, and it's about 50 basis points. Second bucket is everything that is related to the recovery and as a result of pandemic. And this is essentially that disconnect between supply and demand, which is causing those multiple shortages in equipment, in labor, in all sorts of uh, services as well, and which is leading to uh, price uh, upside uh, prices in good manufacturing goods, but also in consumer services. And we believe, as has often been demonstrated in previous cases, uh, let's remember the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Japanese uh, major 
uh, accidents that led to disruption in the automotive supply chain, chain which was restored in a matter of six months. Uh, we've seen other incidents of similar, of similar occurrences. Supply eventually adjusts um, in, in the course of time, and, and we will see that. How long will it take is where I have said it will take longer, and the corporates that we have um, surveyed in the last few weeks have also said that. It will go away, but it will take uh, some time, and more than what we had thought. But in the course of 22, most of them see that essentially being settled. The third bucket uh, is the energy prices, where again, if we learn from previous uh, similar very sharp rise in the price of energy, it will be followed by a period of stabilization and possibly uh, some decline, as has been the case in the past. So for all these reasons, we believe that our analysis is correct. Now, clearly as well, the longer these um, bottlenecks energy prices impact on prices, the more attentive we have to be to the wage impact and to the bargaining arrangements and discussions that will be taking place. And we need to see whether there is a possibility of second round effect. But let me remind you that we are currently in a situation where we have slack, where you have nearly 2 million people less employed in the economy today compared with pre-pandemic, where we have 3 million people who are still on furlough schemes. So there is slack in that respect. And what we are looking at as well is the inflation expectations, which we see in, in, a, in a median analysis as being pretty well anchored. A little bit up, but still very much anchored. Thank you very much. And this concludes today's press conference. Uh, our next regular press conference takes place on 16 December. And up until then, we wish you all the best. Have a great afternoon and goodbye. <laughs>